Welcome back for our final part of a guide to starting your own meadery. And I have, of course, my very knowledgeable guest, very helpful human in the world, Billy Belts from Lost Cause Meadery, here to chat further about this topic. We have been diving super deep, and I encourage you, if you're seeing this as your first one, click off of it. Go back to episode one, because we've built up a, a whole storyline of a meadery. And you'll be very confused if you're just watching this one only. So in this episode, we're going to be talking about launching our meadery, marketing, and a little bit about tasting room side and maybe some selling distribution. You know, what do we want to do there? So, uh, Billy, let's let's talk about we've taken all of these ideas. We've put them to paper. We've got the building. We've got the funding figured out. We've got the licensures now. Uh, we've developed recipes. We have produced however much mead and uh, we're at our day of let's say launch so obviously up until this point we've been making mead would you consider like I mean I'm sure you guys had to do this you had to have a launch day I'm, I'm sure of opening what are some things to make sure you're prepared for before you even open those doors up to people or ship out those boxes yeah I mean um so everything we've covered previously, right, should get you to this point. You have uh, your mead, it, your, your space is built out. Um, you have your mead packaged and ready to sell. Um, and you're, you're ready to open your doors. Um, however, you really need to be working on the marketing and promotion of your meadery months before you're ever going to have even a soft opening. Um, and that needs to start really as, as soon as you can. But um, you'll find that there's a lot of support out there for uh, for a, a new metery, really any, a lot of new businesses um, in terms of people wanting to get the message out, support it, um, PR, uh, media wanting to tell the story. The easiest time to market your metery is like at launch. And, you know, it's just such an it's a layup for um, for writers, uh, for, you know, all your friends and family to come out and support. Uh, so so this should be the easy time. You just have to start before you're planning to open the doors. Yeah. You have to get the word out there. Um, talk to your local homebrew clubs. Mm -hmm. Right. Don't leave anyone out. Uh, friends family, other businesses. Um, you do not need a, a PR firm when you start because everyone wants to write about you. So just reach out to media, reach out to writers. Um, you could bring in some, I hate to say it, but like social media influencers when you open, influencers when you open <laughs> your door. Yeah. Um, a lot of times if it's something new, they just want to be like the first ones to, to showcase it. So you, you could probably get by just inviting them not you don't need to, to pay anyone but um i know i know uh you know that's its own thing um but yeah, yeah so this is the time to get the word out let everyone support you because it's going to be uh harder in year one and year two and year three yeah and then um, whatever you do plan is open with a soft launch mm. so do not open your doors to the public like day one we're ready to go have a soft launch invite your homebrew club one night have a friends and family night. Make sure your point of sale system is working. Mm. If you have any staff, make sure, like, you know, iron out the kinks. Yeah. Well, so, <laughs> yeah, the, the staffing side, I, I didn't even think about that. That totally skipped my mind. But you're right. You're like, theoretically, you could do this by yourself, depending on how large scale you're going. But I'm imagining you're going to want some people there to help you pour stuff, to help you, uh, as you alluded to in, in, the first part of this to maybe be a janitor, <laughs> you know, you don't necessarily want to have to do all those roles or maybe you have to, but yeah, that's a good reminder for me. Eh, maybe some extra people. Yeah. And, and this is also, um, you know, I think a lot of meteries, ours included, you start out, um, the owners are the ones pouring the meads and for probably for, for the first six months or a year. Yeah. Um, so you're doing everything. Um, if you have the ability to have staff, that's great. A lot of times, uh, 
you you want to launch this and and you want to know the ins and outs. You want to be talking as the owner. Mm. You want to be talking to customers that come through the door every single day for the first six months, year minimum to understand what are they saying. And you got to have thick skin. Mm. You have, especially as a metery owner, d- uh, lose the ego, right? Uh, everyone is going to say, oh, you know, a, a metery, like a butchery. No. <laughs> and they come in and you're going to get a lot of grimaces. And, and listen, we make great meat and we make all different styles. Um, it doesn't mean everyone's ready for something new. Yeah. And, uh, you know, if it doesn't taste like their, um, you know, Chardonnay uh, uh, with a, a, a an ice cube or their Coors Light, it may not. It's just it's different. Right. So. You're going to have to deal with grimaces. You're going to have to be with people like, oh, so this is like wine where you just add honey or be like, yeah. where's your IPA? You can deal with it all. It's fine. It's great. Um, but you also learn a lot. So um, you want to be the one behind the bar starting now mm. and um, and learning and, and doing all that. Uh, and then, you know, you have to run the business. So eventually, hopefully you can. Um, bring staff to do those things to to serve to help with some of the other projects and mm. yeah but uh <laughs> those first six months um you learn a a a ton and it's that's where you're either learning or or you're not and you're gonna you know not make the necessary pivots to to be successful well i think that's where as we kind of talked about with like a flagship idea like if you go in thinking everybody's going to love this one. If they don't like I'm in trouble, then that's where you'll get in trouble yourself is that you have to be willing to like take that criticism. And I'm sure one or two people are not going to like the thing that you think is the best thing in the world. Um, And that's going to be as it stands, but you also have to be willing to like pivot and go like, well, hold on. People are really requesting all these cherry meads now. And you can't just like turn your blinders off and be like, no, I'll never make a cherry mead. As you mentioned in yeah. a previous episode, listen to the customers. What What's going to sell? What's going to be the big thing around you? Yeah, yeah. And, in, you know, it is your job to educate people, right? So you, you want to, you know, you want to push people into understanding mead and what it can be. You want to, like we still do that every day. We are educating people not just on mead, but on like what it can be like, no, like here's how cool mm. a buckwheat mead can be, you know, aged in a Oloroso sherry barrel and how like layered and complex and, and, you know, and, and if, if you just serve it to someone, um, they may not get it. If you talk to them about it, you know, they're going to start to understand it. And then you have a, a fan for life. But um, yeah, like to your point, no matter how much you love traditional meads and making traditional meads, uh, you, you got to be okay with people liking Mellow Mel's mm-hmm. more, right? Like every mead maker I know, we all love making traditional meads and we love the purity of it and the idea. And we all sell more fruit meads than traditionals. It's, um, and, and that was, and you know, these are people that make fantastic, some of the best traditional meads in the world. It's just, uh, you just got to go with with yeah. what sells, and you got to learn, and yeah. and yeah. So, um, so you kind of need to do both. You need to listen to people, and then also educate them, and try and 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 you know bring them along. Yeah, well, that's it's so important too. Flexibility. I feel like one of the biggest words we could use here is being flexible, and then knowing what to do next. Uh, that's part of it. So, so we've we've done our soft launch of our meadery, friends, family. We've opened up some doors. We've done months and months of marketing ahead of time, as Billy said, to remind you that this is not something you do the day of. <laughs> Don't wait till the last minute to decide to turn on those marketing jets. Um, what are some things, I'm going to put you a little bit on the spot. What are some things you think, well, you not you think, what are some things you ran into maybe in the first year? Because you just alluded to year one, two, three might be more difficult than that first six month period. What are some things that you remember running into that you were like, this could have been uh, avoided maybe. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, 
a, a, a whole lot of, uh, nothing major, a whole lot of um, lessons that are, for us, we're kind of like space specific or specific to our community where um, you just have to, like you said, be willing to learn. Um, I, I've referenced this in, in some of the previous videos. One thing we learned was the style of mead mm. we were making. We wanted to make this mead that everyone loved. And we learned that sometimes making polarizing meads is actually better for business because the people that love it absolutely adore it and they share it. And, um, and I guess maybe that was the biggest lesson. And I, I was a marketer before I opened a meadery. Um, so I should have already realized this, but, um, one of the biggest lessons was it, it's so much easier if you get people talking about your meadery and your product and their experience to others than you having to mm. reach out to people, right? So, like, forget um, doing any kind of advertising mm. your first year. Forget discounts. Forget Groupon. Forget anything you have to pay for. Don't Don't do any of that. Focus all of your attention on doing things that will get other people to talk about it for you. Think about the experience. Um, what is it about it that is special and will get people so stoked on it that they'll bring their friend or tell their friend? Um, think about the experience in terms of like, are, is there something in the space that someone's going to want to take a picture of and throw on their Instagram feed? Because mm. if there's not, that's a huge opportunity missed, yeah. right? Whether it's a cool space in the tasting room, a mural, whether it's a uh, like we actually put a lot of money into our tasting flights. We got custom stainless steel tasting flights that we could not afford, but it makes for a beautiful picture. And mm. you line up this, you know, nice uh, steel tray that says Lost Cause on it, um, you know, uh, cut out Lost Cause with six different means. And it's actually a beautiful picture. And that helped a lot our first year. People would post pictures of it. It's like, cool, look at this. And we probably got a lot of business from that that we wouldn't have if we just gave it to them, you know, individually in a, in a, in a glass. So yeah. think about visually, what would make you want to take a picture and post it? What would want to get you to share it. Um, that also comes back to the style of meeting. And, and lastly, it comes back to education. So if you've ever gone somewhere and uh, been educated, like you ever done a coffee tasting and you leave there, you're like, wow, I had no idea that, you know, these kind of beans and like a light roast are like way better than like the dark roast I used to love. And, and it just, my whole outlook on coffee is different now. You are you're now uh, you're now a fan for life, right? And you are um, not only how you view that that coffee maker, but then how you um, tell your friends and educate them, and and kind of how you approach coffee going forward. Well, it's the same thing with me. You have a great opportunity to educate people. Mm -hmm. You need to use that to create um, uh, a fun experience because when people learn something. They actually enjoy it. If they can walk away, uh, and, you know, shouldn't feel like school, but if they can walk away feeling like, wow, I learned something I didn't know. I, I had no idea honey varietals could be that cool and that diverse. Um, I'm going to go to my farmer's market next week and look for that avocado blossom honey. Like they, that's a positive experience and they associate now you with that yeah. positive experience. So, so do those things that um, get them talking about it, get them to have a good experience, get them to want to bring other people in and that's going to do a lot more for you your first year than like having to like advertise or mm. something like that. Yeah. Well, I, I appreciate your willingness to show pitfalls too. And uh, obviously you, you guys have worked really hard to get your metery where it is. And um, I have no doubt that there are lots of other lessons that you have that you could tell us about lots of mistakes. I'm sure. I'm sure there've been many batches that have had something happen or situations. There's always those extremes, but is there anything that we missed any overarching thing from our whole journey here? We've kind of reached the end of, of pushing people off at this point. We're just ready to say like, go, 
go do your thing and then report back, you know, for anyone who's interested. But is there any last little comments? I would say uh, develop a, a, a network mm-hmm. and um, you might be surprised how willing some of us are to share um, knowledge, especially if you approach it in the right way. So if you're a, a home mead maker and um, you uh, are going into a meadery and you're, you're a, you know, you're a consumer of their product and you are, uh, taking the steps to learn about their brand, their mead, um, supporting the business, and you approach a, a, a meadery owner and you want to learn some of the, you have specific questions about business side stuff. Um, that goes a long way. That goes a long way compared to just random, like, hey, you know, I want to start a meadery, like, all right, give me your time. So um, doing it the right way and, um, and then creating a network is critical. All a lot of these lessons are, are actually things I've learned from other people. And you're gonna have things come up that we haven't talked about in these videos. You're gonna have things that came up that are just you have no answer for. And so that network of owners, whether it's a, a brewery owner, a winery owner, a cidery owner, uh, a, a you know a, a mead maker. You're gonna have a lot of mead making questions that happen when you when you go commercial. Um, that's that all pays dividends. So create that network. Start to um, start to understand like who who can help you and how can you help them back. So when I was first getting started, I actually approached another meadery here at the time and said, "Hey, let me do some uh, marketing consulting for you for free." just so I can pick your brain on like business stuff. And so try and make it a win-win if you're able to offer that. Um, but yeah, a network is huge because once things start rolling, it's uh, you're gonna have a lot of like, oh, I need an answer to this like today. Mm-hmm. And so you need to be able to go out and you know ask those questions and, um, and have people you can rely on. I think it's great. I, I love that advice too. Obviously, the mead community at large is um, gen- generally very supportive of each other. Uh, so I think that's that's a great thing we have going for us. Being able just to have that, that social network is going to be helpful for you. Well, Billy, thank you so much for, for investing in our community, uh, this whole series. My hope is that as people have um, walked their way through these videos, that they have gained a greater knowledge of what they're doing, maybe more confidence, hopefully, towards opening their meadery. Like you said, there are still going to be things that pop up, still issues that arise. And uh, don't be surprised when you don't have the answer based off of what we've talked about. I feel like we've scratched the surface pretty well, but there's still things to uh, happen, unfortunately. That's just how life works. So I will be putting every link I could possibly find to Lost Cause below to uh, support Billy, support the whole community that community there. He's making world famous mead. That's not even, that's not just like a, something I'm saying that is a true statement. The world knows about lost cause and you should go check them out. Billy, thank you so much for investing time in our, in our whole community. Yeah. Thanks Garrett. Thanks for having me. All right. Check out those links and uh, let me know what you think below. Of course, if you're interested, I'd love to hear if maybe you're inspired now to go off and start your own meadery and we'll see you maybe when you're in business. So cheers. Cheers.